Good evening, everyone. So I uh, thought I'd do this message, um, you know, uh, in light of some of the things we've you know, been going through. Uh, as you know, I'm with the Associates for Biblical Research, and uh, we have an important decision to make by way of our uh, archaeological dig. Just give you a sense of the thing. Uh, uh, Associates for Biblical Research, uh, and it's been around since 1967, and they run the largest archaeological digs in the world. Um, and we've been doing that for a number of years. Our own Gordon Franz was the lead archaeologist for that organization. He was on the dig that found the oldest copy of Scripture ever found until recently. And uh, um, the largest dig in the world last year and for a number of years has been at what they, the Israelis, call Shiloh and what you would know as Shiloh. Now, what's the significance of Shiloh in the Bible? Well, it's pretty significant. It's where the tabernacle stood for a few hundred years during the book of Judges. And uh, so ABR, Associates for Biblical Research, we have an important decision to make because Shiloh on your map, in your Bible map, is due north of Jerusalem. And you have to go by a town to get to Shiloh. The town is called Ramallah. Ramallah is the capital of the West Bank. It's the, where the Palestinian Authority is located. And um, you're in the West Bank. So it's not like you can exactly call up the local Israeli policeman and say, we need your help here. You're in the West Bank. And for the most part, we've been digging there for a number of years now, and we haven't had too many difficulties. You, uh, uh, we have a pretty good relationship with the Palestinians, pretty good relationship with the Israelis. Uh, most of our food comes from the Palestinians. Uh you know, our bus drivers are Israeli, um, and uh, hotels we tend to stay in are Palestinian, but Israeli government really uh, um, has been very good to us. So, you know, think about this. We've got about 200 people who are scheduled to go over to Israel in about two months, and a number of them are her age, Hazel's age, Um and they're not quite as old as Angel, but they're Hazel's age. And um, I don't know who's older between there. Are you older? You may be older. Uh, he's older. Yeah. Uh, so what do you do when you're thinking about um, sending 200 people over and maybe 50 of them are college kids? And you're putting them into the West Bank. And uh, the West Bank is controlled by the Palestinians, although the Israelis have a military presence there. And that's not Gaza. But um, it's the West Bank nonetheless. So... Appreciate your prayers in that regard, and we're going to circle back to that as we go through this tonight, because you are seeing right before your eyes, if you go to the next slide, um, Bible prophecy uh, being fulfilled right before your eyes each night on the news. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, I first got saved, there was a book called The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. And Hal Lindsey had certain things he said would be indicators that you were drawing close to the time of the end. You know, you'd see the European Union coming together where they'd start to be a center piece of thought in almost a move to replace the United States. And uh, uh, you'd see Germ East Germany and West Germany come together and you'd see, uh, you know, uh, a number of different things. And of course, a lot of those things have already occurred. Uh, but let's just set this up because the clock by which the world operates, the clock that governs in the affairs of men is Israel. If you want to watch where we're at in human history, watch what's going on with Israel. And I think perhaps the best indication that we've drawn close to the return of the Lord, and we believe in the rapture of the church to be followed by a seven-year tribulation, and then the, ultimately the second coming of Christ to the earth— and then a reign of his for a thousand years before we enter the eternal state. Um, but part of what occurs before the tribulation can take place is that Israel must be in land again. It's the whole focal point of the tribulation. So Hosea 9, 17, Hosea is writing about 800 years before Christ or in the 700s BC, 8th century BC. Um, and he writes this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. My God will cast them away because they did not obey him and they shall be wanderers among the nations. Uh, and uh, if you want to read about pathos, 
And we start using terms that are sophisticated terms, right? Pathos, this move of emotion and, and sorrow and grief and pathos. Read what the prophets write about God's thoughts towards Israel as he longingly but sorrowfully uh, knows that their judgment is a coming and he's going to turn them over uh, to the Gentile nations. And there's a, a short-term judgment and then there's a longer-term judgment that comes. We know that... Um, Eventually, the northern kingdom of Israel was carried off into captivity, 722 B.C. by the Assyrians. The southern kingdom of Judah was ultimately carried off into captivity at 586 B.C. Uh, by Babylon. You want to know dates. You can't be a good Bible student if you don't know dates. Um, by the way, a little, little thing for you to remember. If you want to remember when most of the prophets show up, they show up in two clusters in the Old Testament. About half of them show up at the time that Israel's getting ready to be carried off by Assyria, right before. And about half of them show up at the time that Judah is being carried off to captivity by Babylon. And why is that? Because God is a God that's not willing that any should perish. And he's trying to get a hold of his people. Repent. Turn around. I don't. It just doesn't have to occur. Time again, you see the southern kings of Judah. God says, look, there's a judgment coming. But you know what, Josiah? Because you're faithful to me, I'm going to hold it off a generation. And basically, the same offer goes to his son. But anyway, this prophecy of judgment coming to Israel goes back as Israel turned their back on God. And then you get one of the most ominous passages as we click to the next slide. Um, in Deuteronomy 28, then the Lord will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other, and there you shall serve other gods, which neither you nor your fathers have known, wood and stone. And among those nations you shall find no rest, nor shall the sole of your foot have a resting place. But there the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing eyes, and anguish of soul. Your life shall hang in doubt before you. You shall fear day and night and have no assurance of life. The terms that show up in the Old Testament that actually use the term holocaust. And uh, we know that the history of Israel, the history of Israel is that they have been a persecuted people like no other. Does that mean no other groups have been persecuted? Of course not. But this group has a special satanic design on it. You know, I love the Irish. I'm Irish. I love the Scottish. The wife's the Scottish. But the Irish were not marked out for destruction by Satan. The Scottish were not marked out for destruction by Satan, nor were the Chinese. But Satan marked out Israel for destruction. And why is that? Because this book is fulfilled through Israel. They were the line that brought about the Messiah. He hates that. Time and again, you see his effort to destroy Israel, to keep the Messiah from coming into the world. There's only one way Satan can be beaten. That's by the death of the God-man on the cross. So he's trying to stop that. And once it occurs, what's the next thing? Got to wipe out Israel. Because all of those promises related to a kingdom of God on earth, a messianic kingdom, must be fulfilled in Israel. There's no Israel, and prophecy is broken. And he is desperate to do that. So Israel has been in his crosshairs perpetually. And you see that in history. By the way, little dates that are that are signals indicators that um, something supernatural is afoot. Here's a date for you. Tishbaav. Tishbaav shows up in history. So what's Tishbaav? Well, you know, somewhere in the middle of the summer, it changes every year. The Hebrew calendar has 360 days to it. We have 365. But Tishbaav means the ninth of Av, the month of Av. It generally occurs in the middle of the summer. This year, it's sometime in August. Uh, that date shows up time and again in history. It's a creepy date. When the Babylonians sacked the temple and breached Jerusalem's walls, Tishba'ah, 586 BC. When the Romans breached the walls of the city and ultimately took the temple mount and set it on fire, Tishba'ah, the ninth of Av. Kristallnacht, Tishba'ah, uh, I think it's Kristallnacht. Uh, the pogroms start in Russia. It's persecution of the uh, Jewish people, Tishba'ah, ninth of Av. Weird dates that show up in history. It shows that there's a satanic intention towards Israel. And of course, you, unless you're uh, uh, completely ignorant, you know that history has this wave of, of 
hatred towards the Jewish people. By the way, the night that the Inquisition starts in Spain is Tish B'Av. Uh, interesting study for you who like history, like histor historians like uh, Mr. Angel back there. Um, study the makeup of Christopher Columbus's crew. A number of those guys. And it's theorized that maybe more than half. There's a lot of theory about Christopher Columbus himself. I think it's been settled that largely he was he uh, was Italian, but uh, a good portion of his crew is Jewish. And the night he leaves, I believe it's the next day that the Spanish start off the uh, Inquisitions, 1492. So just interesting date that shows up. And of course, we know that the Catholic Church and in, in Western Europe um, killed many, many Jews. Um, as part of the Inquisition. We know that the pogroms in Russia killed many, many Jews. And of course, we all know what Adolf Hitler did. Uh, the start of World War II, really the start of the Holocaust, um, which a little bit before that, 1938 is the founding of Friends of Israel, which Steve Herzog is part of, uh, um, parts of. And they were doing that, trying to urge the U.S. government to let the uh, Jews in from Europe. And... Um, it's estimated, there's different estimates. You have hard numbers coming out of Russia to figure out, but the classic number has been 6 million. I've recently seen studies that say probably closer to 7 million uh, Jews were killed during the Holocaust. The number out of Russia is what's the problem. But we do know this, by the end of the Second World War, there were only 500,000 Jews left in Israel, I mean, in, in Europe. Um, so indeed, that prophecy of Deuteronomy and many other prophecies have been fulfilled uh, before our eyes over history and in recent times. Going to the next passage. And then you have this promise that Jeremiah gives. Um, Therefore, do not fear, O my servant Jacob, says the Lord, nor be dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save you from afar and your seed from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return and have rest and be quiet and no one shall make him afraid, for I am with you, says the Lord, to save you, though I make a full end of all the nations where I have scattered you, yet I will not make a complete end of you. But I will correct you in justice, and will not let you go altogether unpunished. There is a promise from God through this, that even though they were going to be cast off, and they would suffer mightily at the hands of wicked Gentiles, that he'd keep them preserved, some remnant of them preserved around the world. Um, traveled a lot for the company I used to work for Morgan Stanley. You probably have traveled more. But one of the things that, that I found interesting, whenever I'd go, be sent over to these countries for Morgan Stanley, I always had something I did. Every country I went to, I would go find a synagogue. And I can say that I never went to a country where I didn't find a synagogue. God preserved them, even when he cast them off. He preserved them in all the nations that he sent them. And then there's this promise given in Scripture that one day, go on to the next slide, and this prophecy shows up dozens of times in the Old Testament, that he would bring them back to the land. Therefore, behold, the days are coming. By the way, that is a moniker. That's an indication. He's talking about the time of the end. This expression, the days are coming, or in that day. Jeremiah writes this. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that it shall no more be said, the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt. But the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands where he had driven them. For I will bring them back into their land, which I gave to their fathers. And we have seen the fulfillment of that in some of our lifetimes. Some of you were born before 1948. Some of us were born before... Well, I was born in 67. The rest of you were born after 67. Um, that prophecy has been fulfilled in the span of some of our lifetimes. May 14, 1948, Israel came back in the land. Ezekiel 37 um, is this uh, uh, metaphorical story that absolutely was fulfilled about God bringing the Jews back into the land. This is what Isaiah writes in 11. It shall come to pass in that day, again, it's an indication of the time of the end, that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left. What's it talking about here? The second time. 
from Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros and Cush, from Elam and Shinar, from Hamath and the islands of the sea. He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Isaiah is writing 700 plus years before Christ. He's writing before the first regathering of Israel. Israel was cast, Judah was cast off to Babylon in 586 BC. They don't start coming back to 538. Neither of those events occurred in the time of Isaiah. And yet he's talking about God at one point would gather them a second time. So he's not looking to the near return under Babylon. He's looking to that far return that would occur in that day. And he throws out these nations, Pathros and Cush and Elam and Shinar, Hamath and the islands of the seas, basically saying from all over the place. He's got at least three different continents mentioned there. Egypt and Africa and uh, the islands of the sea and uh, Pathros and Cush and Elam and Shinar. This is a... Um, a reference that at the time of the end, he would assemble the outcasts of Israel, the Jews, back to the land from Judah, from the four corners of the earth. So sure enough, next slide, uh, we started to see that occur in the past 107 years. A little bit of a timeline here, and this explains a lot of what's going on in the world right now. But in 1917, England is in the midst of a desperate struggle with Germany. The U.S. has not entered the war yet. Uh, by the way, Germany had a thin clock to win World War One. Do you know that? They defeated Russia in the East. They bring three million troops from the East over to the West. The U.S. has not got into the war yet. If Lusitania gets sunk, we're about to get in the war, but we've got to send all our troops over there. It's not like today where you board a 747 or these big cargo jets and fly over there. you got to get the troops trained and then send them over. It takes a few months for us to get into the war. So Germany has a thin window of time. Thin window of time. They've beaten Russia in the East. If they can force the issue to resolution in Paris, grab the city of Paris, the French sue for peace, game over. A thin window of time. England is losing troops like a sieve. So there's a guy by the name of Lord Balfour. He is a Christian. He is a born-again, Bible-thumping Christian, just like we are. He's also England's foreign secretary during World War I. He approaches Chaim Weissman who later would be Israel's first president, and convinced him to rally world Jewry behind the British cause. I'm going to let you in a little secret. Some of the best scientists in the world, a lot of the best scientists in the world, they just happen to be Jewish. The Jews are developing sophisticated weaponry that can put the war on the Western front between England and Germany in the favor of the British. And Chaim Weissman gets the Jewish people of the world, to start to back England. Now think about this. Germany's population in World War I is about 10% Jewish. Do you know that about 20% of their army is Jewish? So think about this. It's insane, Hitler, 20 years later. They're arresting Jewish officers who won the Blue Max and the highest, the Distinguished Service Cross, or the... Uh, uh, the highest awards that G Germany gives out to its soldiers, and many of them are won by Jewish troops during the First World War. And they're arresting them 20 years later. Anyway, um, so Balfour makes this move, gets world Jewry to, to, support, to support England. And it has a big part in swaying the war in England's favor. In response to that, the Balfour Declaration is issued, which basically is gives this mandate that if we win this war, we are going to give Israel a homeland in the country. There is no country of Palestine at this time. There is no country of Saudi Arabia at this time. There is no country of Iraq at this time. There's no country of Yemen at this time or Oman. There's no country of Finland at this time. There's no country of Czechoslovakia at this time. There's no country of Hungary at this time. All these nations come out of World War I. And what the British do is they say, we're going to give Palestine for the Palestinians and Israel for the Jews. You know who owns all this territory at this point? The Ottoman Turks. And who did the Turks side with? Germany. So when the Ottoman Turks lose World War I with Germany, guess what happens to their empire? It gets carved up. It gets carved up and these nations are founded. Iraq is founded and Jordan, what they call trans is founded. And this little sliver of land that was to be the Jews all ruckus breaks up. So the British follow through on all these other commitments, but not with Israel. By the way, were there any Jews 
in the promised land or in Palestine at this point in history? Tons of them. Tons of them. Don't get this idea in your head that there were no Jews there till World War II in 1948. There's always been a Jewish presence in Israel. Always been a Jewish presence in Israel. Uh, so, uh, anyway, you know what happens in World War II and the Holocaust? It convinces most of the rest of the world that the Jews need to have that land given to them that Britain had promised. So they set up the nation of Israel and their own state. They leave Jerusalem in control of the Palestinians and the Arabs. Um, and the United States leads the way in voting for the establishment of the nation of Israel. Next slide. So the state of Israel is born. And uh, basically you want to understand that people start to flock to Israel. Between May 15th of 48 and the close of 1951, 684,201 Jews returned to the land. 121,000 Jews from Iraq returned. 37,000 Jews from Bulgaria returned. 30,000 500 Jews from Libya, 103,000 Jews from Poland. By the way, how many Jews are left in Poland after they return? Less than 50,000. You know how many Jews there were in Poland at the start of World War II? Two million. It's only 150,000 left at the end of the war. Hitler took the rest. Uh, Romania, 118,940 returned. Yemen, 47,000, or virtually the entire Jewish population, save for two synagogues from Yemen, returned by 1951. And the story can be told over and over and over again. Um, next slide. Continues on. Um, by May of 1973, the population had risen to 3.2 million, vast majority of which were Jews, most of which were Jews, 70, 75%. Uh, incidentally, what nation has the most Jews in the world right now? It's Israel. Recently, Israel passed the United States. Israel has about 6.4 million Jews. We have... Just about 6 million Jews. You know what the next country is after us? Way, 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 way behind us? It's France. About 100,000 there. It's really the U.S. And, and Israel make up the most of the world's Jews. Now watch this. Look at this next slide. This is your nightly newspaper. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3. Zechariah is writing a few, what, 400, 450 years uh, before Christ. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen, there's that expression, in that day, the time of the end, that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. It's Jerusalem. It's all about Jerusalem. Um, the expression that Hamas used, and unfortunately, uh, uh, some very ignorant uh, Westerners picked up. You, know, camp, you watch the protests down at Columbia or the ones in, this, in and around uh, college campuses. Uh, the, the expression that was used uh, was from the river to the sea. Hamas said from the river to the sea. You know what that means, right? Sea being the Mediterranean Sea. What's the river? Jordan River. They want everything from the Mediterranean Sea to the Jordan River. What's sitting in the middle there? Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, Haifa, everything. They want everything. So you all know what happened on October 7th, 2023. Go to the next slide. So this is a guy here on the left. He is uh, Jim Showers. He's uh, Steve Herzig's boss. It's okay. Uh, um, uh, but Jim Showers is a good brother in the Lord. Um, he's there with uh, two fellows, two Jewish fellows. The guy in the middle, yeah, him, good job. Um, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but it's Shlomo, which, uh, or Shmuel, which means Samuel. Actually, did a pretty good job, Shmuel, Samuel. Shmuel is the guy who developed a very neat way to build bomb shelters and to do it quickly. And we, your chapel, funded a little bit of that uh, one of our fifth Sunday offerings, right? We gave money to ABR, which built uh, one of these bomb shelters. I'll show you them in a second. The guy on the left is uh, responsible, and his name I I can't quite get, so I'm not even going to try it. But he's responsible for the medical program and uh, that um, 
helps provide equipment to Israel. So just show you some of these things. Go to the next slide. So these are Medi cycles. They're wonderful because you can get around things pretty quickly. Friends of Israel's bought three of these things. They're worth more than a BMW, believe it or not. They're loaded with fantastic equipment to quickly triage situations. And that, that stuff on the back is, is uh, maybe not worth more than a BMW. The next thing is worth more than a BMW, though, I assure you. But Friends of Israel has been working with these people to buy these things. They're built out of Europe. They're shipped over to Israel. They're really these sophisticated metacycles they can get in and around real quick. Unfortunately, we didn't get them there till November. So next slide is these ambulances. Friends of Israel uh, has paid for five of these things. They are all built by a company down in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And these are the most elaborate and expensive ambulances in the world. Uh, they're far more sophisticated than anything you've ridden on uh, riding around here. And we paid for five of these things. One last thing. Go to the next slide. This is the bomb shelter. This is not the one we paid for. Um, now, it doesn't look very big until you realize it goes way back. You're seeing kind of an entrance way. Um, Friends of Israel's paid for 76 of these. And you know where most of them were located? Along the Gaza Strip. Long Gaza Strip in kibbutzes, kind of neat. Um, they can hold as many as 40 people in them. We know that most of these bomb shelters were used. Uh, well, they were all used on October 7th when the attacks started to occur. Uh, Israel sent a thank you note to Friends of Israel because they say that those bomb shelters saved 2,000 lives that day. Do you know what's inside every bomb shelter? Isaiah 53. Just a quote, Isaiah 53 is in every bomb shelter from Friends of Israel. You do this stuff, you're trying to build credibility with Israel to get them to think you care about them. You want them to know you care about them because you want them to know you really care about them far more than they know because you want them to meet the one who died for you and died for them too. So anyway, go to the next slide. This is Genesis 6.13. This is one of those creepy things. God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Look at the word violence, Genesis 6, 13. Let's take a look at the Hebrew. Go to the next slide, if you would, Hazel. This is from the Blue Letter Bible. It gives you the English spelling of the word for violence in Hebrew. Go to the next slide. Did you realize that the word for violence in the Bible, in your Hebrew Bible, is Hamas? You say, why would they choose that as their name? You wonder why they chose that as their name? By the way, in Arabic, it means strength and bravery. It's interesting, the Quran uses Hamas for strength and bravery. The Bible uses Hamas for violence and wickedness. Just find that very interesting. So, um, you know, the attack occurred on October 7th. Little story for you. Um, there's an image, 6.30 in the morning, the rockets started to fly, thousands and thousands of rockets. Um, the attack resulted in 1,139 deaths, uh, 695 of which were Israeli civilians, including 36 little children, uh, 71 foreign nationals, and 373 uh, Israeli soldiers were killed that day. Uh, approximately 250, nobody knows the exact number. They still don't know the exact number. Probably 250 Israeli civilians and soldiers were taken hostage to the Gaza Strip, including 30 children below the age of six. Different kind of people you're fighting. Um, you all heard about the music festival. If you go to the next slide, this is the Raim music festival. This one field here, 364 were killed, 40 hostages were taken. Um, what Hamas did was they shot up each of the cars, uh, tried to grab as many hostages as they could. Uh, you know the stories, you know what type of hostages they were really interested in. We'll leave it at that. Um, um, when Israel went through, they had to do a firefight and they basically made a decision to blow up every car because there were snipers in the cars. And you cannot believe when the camera pans, 
how far down this set of cars goes. Because what the Israelis did came after the massacre took place. And I've been there. Israel's funny. They like to do these rave events. These music festivals go on all night long. I wasn't at the rave event. I will assure you of that. But they're holding it across the Sea of Galilee from my kibbutz that I was staying at. And he wanted to get up and say, can you turn the radio off or whatever you're doing off? But uh, these things go on all night. They were a sitting target. Um, anyway, if you go to the next slide, um, this just gives you a sense of how far down all the cars were uh, that ended up having to be destroyed. It's like that little blue car is saying, get me out of here. Right? Um, the rest were all forged. Anyway, keep going. Um, big thing that the uh, Hamas did was they went after the kibbutz and uh, they targeted foreigners. Uh, they don't want foreigners to be there. Um, and they really made havoc on the kibbutz. So this leads me to the story I want to finish with. And if you go to the next slide. So this is a lady who is responsible for the call center, the 911 call center that's in the kibbutz area, the southern part, right along the Gaza Strip. Um, now, I've since clarified this since earlier in the night. But um, so Friends of Israel and uh, Friends of Israel is an interesting organization. Um, you know, Steve Herzig, he was commended by one of the assemblies. Uh, it's always had assembly board members on it. We started this thing. Kind of drives me crazy. We lost it somewhere. We started this. It was assemblies in, Phil in the Philadelphia area that started Friends of Israel, along with some Baptist groups and some PCA type groups. And somehow we lost control of it. That's okay. It's a wonderful organization. They they um, and now assembly guys are back on the board and and have a lot of influence over it. But um, one of the things that was done 15, 20 years ago was a lot of money was put to set up assemblies. And they're really Bible churches. They're not assemblies like we have, but Bible churches in Jerusalem and Rehovah, which is south of Jerusalem. Now, why I mention this is uh, when you hear of evangelical works in Israel, let me tell you something. They're almost always amongst the Arabs. The Arabs are far more responsive to the gospel than the Jews are. It's just a fact. But these two assemblies, they have somehow hit on something with younger Jewish people. And there's hundreds of Jews who were born in the land, Israeli Jews, that have gotten saved. And they're all in the military. They're all working these 911 call centers. You know, they're required if you're right now, Angel and John and, um, you know, Ramos would still be in the reserves. But Angel and John would probably, you might be out of the military by now. Um, you'd be getting ready because everybody's got to serve two years active duty military. Boys have to serve three years active duty military. And then the girls, they're done after their two years, but most of them stay kind of as a reservist. The boys are locked into being reservists till they get old and crotchety like Ezekiel. Um, but you're basically a reservist till you get up into your 40s. Um, so this country is always on a war footing. Um, so the assembly in Rehoboth and the assembly in Jerusalem, 39 of them were called up to go fight this war. 39, can you imagine? Closest thing to that is Bethany Chapel. You know, when we were fighting World War II, right? We had a number of our guys called up and went off to fight the war. Well, this is their world. Anyway, I bring this story up because this woman came out to meet our team. Uh, I wasn't on this trip. This is back in January. And she's a senior person with the call center. And this is the story I want to tell you. So she gets a phone call at 630 in the morning on October 7th. And and her boss, now her husband is away on maneuvers. He's with the Israeli army. He's a reservist, but they're doing maneuvers in the north part of the country. So she's home alone with her two little kids, little kids, a nine-year-old and a six-year-old. Now watch this. She's at home with a nine-year-old and a six-year-old. Her boss calls her up and he says, um, I know it's early in the morning. Get yourself in here. There's something going on and you got to get in here because we are being overwhelmed with phone calls. And she goes, what are you talking? I got two little kids. I, I, my husband's away. I got a nine-year-old and a six-year-old. Get in here. I'll explain everything when you get here. But let me just tell you this. We're being overrun. So now she gets in her car. She's got to drive 13 miles to the call center. And everywhere she's going, she's watching missiles fly over her head. She gets to the call center. She's got these two little kids. You're like, what in the world is going on here? So she brings the two little kids in with her. She parks them by her seat. And she says, sit here. She gives them water. And she starts taking phone calls. And the phone calls are from these kibbutz these kibbutz that are being overrun. And she's having conversations with these people who are in these kibbutz. And one of the phone, first phone calls she gets, she gets two calls right off the bat. One is from a little boy who's nine, 
who's got his sister who is six. She's got a nine-year-old and she's got a six-year-old, right? So the boy's sister, um, I think mommy and daddy have been shot. And I think my older sister has been shot. Um, what do I do? So she says, okay, here's what you're going to do. You're the man in the family now. So what I'd like you to do is I want you to go into the closet. Think about the quick thinking, right? I want you to go in the closet, take your sister and pile a bunch of clothes on her. And you go in, a, you go in that same closet, you pile a bunch of clothes on you. And no matter what, don't say a word. No matter what happens, no matter what happens to your sister, no matter what happens outside, don't say a word. She goes, I'll talk to you. I'm not going to talk to you because if I speak, they'll they'll hear. But I'm going to be with you the whole time. So she's got that call going on while another call comes in. It's a technician. It's a medical technician who had been training with him, 21-year-old. I don't know how old you are, 22? So not her age. Technician, she's a, she's a medic. She says, uh, I'm at this kibbutz. We're kind of being overrun. And uh, I'm triaging people. Can you get an ambulance here? Now, by this point, this, the 911 staff is being told, there are no ambulances. There are no medicycles. There are no ambulances going. We're in a war. We're not going to endanger the ambulance personnel going into the, until the Israeli army stabilizes it. So she has to say to her in the calmest of ways, hang tight. It's going to be a long wait. And we'll go into the rest of that story. But needless to say, at one point, she kept getting phone calls every hour. And she said the girl was impeccably professional. At one point, they know that the kibbutz was being defended by two Israeli soldiers who were out of ammunition, but they kept tricking Hamas into thinking they had ammunition because they set off firecrackers. And Hamas was kept at bay for basically four hours. But you understand the Israeli army is being overrun. They haven't gotten a chance to get their act together. So um, and eventually they took out the two guys and they killed everyone who was in the kibbutz, including this girl who she knew, but now she's got these two little kids in this closet area in a kibbutz that's right next to this kibbutz. Here's a weird, weird thing. The 911 operators are repeatedly getting phone calls from little kids who are hiding in closets. And what you get the sense is that these Israeli parents were creating commotions to keep them away from their kids because so many kids were not found. Um, so the problem with the Hamas is that they're wearing Israeli army uniforms. And they're calling out, hey, come out, come out. We're in Israeli army uniforms. So all of a sudden, the 911 call operators are starting to realize we've got a problem on our hands because we're about to send the Israeli army into these places. And these little kids are not going to know whether these guys are theirs or somebody else's. You know how they solve the problem? Open your Bibles to Deuteronomy 6. You know what every little Israeli boy and every little Israeli girl knows? Do you know what every Israeli soldier knows? Do you know what every Israeli call operator knows? Every one of them knows this. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength through all your might. It's called the Shema. Every Israeli boy knows it. Every Israeli girl knows it. They probably don't even know what it means, but they know it. And you know what else? Israeli soldiers know it too. So the 911 call operators tell the Israeli army, whenever you enter a room, start, quote, start quoting the Shema. And droves of little kids start coming out of these closets because they knew Hamas guys dressed in Israeli uniforms would not know God's word. Finish with this last slide of the day. One more slide, sorry. It's one of the saddest verses of the Bible, but it's also a promise. Zechariah 12.10, and I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. This is at the time of the end. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. 
Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Boy, the Trinity operative at play is fantastic. God, in one sense, is talking about me as himself. And then in the next sense, he's talking about him as if it's someone else. And we know that God the Father and God the Son are both communicating here. And you know what's behind this whole verse? And you know what it is. It's the crucifixion of our Lord. One day, Israel will know that the carpenter's son from Nazareth is Moshiach, Yeshua, the one promised of old. And you're starting to see some Jews realize that now. So if they read Isaiah 53 in a bomb shelter, or if they see on the side of a metacycle or an ambulance something that says paid for by your Christian friends in the United States, maybe it softens their heart. But one day, Israel will know. They will know that the Lord Jesus Christ died for them too. So you happen to live in an area that has far more Jews than any other place in the country. There are two million of them right next to you. New York City has more Jews in it than any other city on the face of the earth. I worked at Morgan Stanley on Montague Street right by the Brooklyn Bridge. I was right next to um, the Jewish community you know, of, of, of Brooklyn. They're all Hasidic Jews. And I will tell you this, some of them do know it's the carpenter's son. They just don't come out and say it. So let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer. And thank you for listening to me. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the nation of Israel. Father, we realize that um, no nation is perfect. We know, Father, that um, we know that you've used these people, this lineage, through which the whole world has the opportunity to be saved. Father, you chose the small people, the least of people, as your scripture says, to be the vehicle by which you would send the seed of the woman into the world, and that it was a Jew who went to the cross. It was a Jew who paid the price for our eternal sins, and it's a Jew who sits on the throne of heaven today. And Father, we realize that you are not willing that any should perish but that all should come to the saving knowledge of your son. So, Father, as we have occasion, we Gentiles who've come from afar, uh, we know you considered it too small a thing that just the children of Israel would know your son as Savior. You called them even from the land of Sinim, uh, from the east and from the west and from the north, to come and worship him, worship you. So, Father, we pray that we... As we look at the events of history and we see lots of lies and lots of falsehoods spread around in the media, that we might understand your perspective and your way of viewing things. You care like crazy for the Palestinians living in Gaza. You care like crazy for like the Palestinians living in the West Bank. And you care like crazy for the Jew living in Jerusalem and the ones living in Brooklyn too. And you also happen to have a tremendous, tremendous love for Dominicans and Mexicans and El Salvadorians and Irish and Scots and Chinese and Germans, and you're a God who is not willing that any should perish. Far be it from us, Father, that we would be a people who would not take this message of life and truth about the Lord Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. So give us a zeal for evangelism, Father, as we share the truth of the scripture and prophecy as it unfolds before our eyes with uh, those around us. Christ, name we pray. Amen.